Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our latest webinar regarding the recent tax and transfer pricing developed in Latin America. This webinar is going to be presented by me, Victor, together with my colleagues, Hector and Delisa. We'll firstly begin with uh, the tax and transfer pricing developments in Brazil, afterwards the, the Andean community, and uh, to finalize, we'll deal with Argentina. In case you have any questions, please feel free to ask them via the shaft function. And uh, without any further ado, let's begin the webinar. Uh, can, I, can I change the slide, please, Hector? So Brazil is going to an indirect, indirect tax, uh, tax reform for indirect taxation. And the goal of this reform is to simplify the tax system, which companies are currently spending 1,500 hours per year to pay taxes. Brazil is uh, known for the complex tax system in which has more than 5,000 regulations only concerning VAT. And this creates a higher legal uncertainty. And due to the high legal uncertainty, the, there's a high litigation on the, um, that it compromises already 51% of the domestic, uh, domestic gross product of the country. The, another aim of this uh, reform is the tax fairness, which will eliminate preferential regimes and increase the exempt income for uh, personal income tax. Here, you, I will start with the income tax reform, and we will begin with the highlights of the, this modification, and then we will get into some specific on the most important points. Uh, the interest on the equity capital will, will be no, it's a financial instrument which is similar to dividends, which it can be deducted on the, on the Brazilian legislation, it will not be applicable after 2022. Uh, please note that this is, a, this is a bill still and has not been approved and might not go forward, but uh, we are in the last stages and uh, is expected to be approved and be applicable as of next year, if it's, if it's approved by the end of this year. So, so far we haven't had any development since the July, August, but um, it's expected to go on track for next year. Another major, another major change is that dividends, which are currently exempt from uh, exempt, are going to be taxed at 20%, and or either 15%. And this is currently under discussion. The we will go back to the disguised profit distribution um, regulations, in which the do once the dividends are now back to being taxed, we we'll have the regulations which. Uh, Makes so those taxes makes the 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 the, the proper distribution more complex and makes it more difficult for people to reduce capital and uh, avoid paying dividend taxes. The offshore offshore regulations are going to change and uh, this is going to be considered a distribution even though the profits are not realized and the per and the legal the legal entity or the person will have to pay taxes on unrealized gains. The EREPJ, which means for the for the corporate income tax, will be reduced. Will be reduced from 12.5, but the additional 10 would be maintained for for the profit above a certain threshold. The effective profit regime, which is is a um, real taxation, well, how we call it in Brazil, is a regime in which you are taxed on your real gains and other presumed profits because you have the option to choose between these two. And uh, currently, currently, some entities which are only asset based or such a immovable property has a benefit because they don't have costs. We'll get into details on this, but this type of co companies, including which receive royalties, will not be taxed at this preferential regimes anymore. And uh, and the capital reduction in the in a legal entity will only be at market value, and this relates to the this price profit distribution. Next slide, please.
the, the capitalization of the illegal, illegal entity abroad as well will only be at uh, market value. The goodwill will not now will be prohibited to be deducted in 2021, which is currently to, it's a, one of the difference from Brazil tax system, which you can deduct the goodwill. The indirect capital gains for indirect transfer of shares are cu currently has a preferential treatment, and this will change uh, have establishing some new thresholds. And the closed funds for investments funds will not be, will now be subject to new regulations and will be have to pay taxes on the different uh, periodicity compared to the current regime. Uh, next slide, please. The financial investments are now going to be taxed at a single rate of 15%, which they are currently exempt. And the, prop the same for the property investment funds, which are currently exempt which creates a more beneficial regime instead of you buying property you you invest in a property fund a property investment fund then you will not pay tax on this on this regime is, is supposed to end by next year the the, the the same for the share and investment funds which are currently not qualified as investment entities due to the legal requirements the stock exchange now the calculation the calculation for people operating the stock exchange will be able to change for quarterly, and this is currently monthly. So this is going to be uh, reduce the compliance necessity for who is operating the stock market and financial instruments. And uh, the personal income tax rates are going to change for are going to be have a higher exemption. I will do this in the next slide, please. As you can see here, the we have a bigger amount of uh, people who are going to be exempt. We will have an adjustment on the personal income tax. So uh, currently, the profit up to 1,900 are exempt, and we're going to update this table to 2,500. And we are, it's ex this uh, update on the income tax table is expected to make more than 16 million people in Brazil tax exempt. And more than 30, 30 million people will benefit with this reduction. So this promotes tax tax fairness in Brazil and the uh, taxing more who have more higher income on a higher bracket after after 5,300. 5, Next slide, please. Taxation of so here we'll, we'll begin to deal with more specifically for some of the tax reform in Brazil. The taxation of distribution the, of the taxation for dividends are now going to be in place. Currently, Brazil is one of the only countries who do not tax the do not tax dividends either with the corporate income tax or withholding tax. This measure was uh, applicable. This uh, measure was applicable in Brazil around 20 years ago when they extinguished the taxation of dividends with the aim to tax at the, at the when the income is realized and not at the distribution. However, this and this avoids lots of uh, the kinds of disguised disguised distribution of profits to rents and to royalties and loans. And we had moved for uh, we have moved to the tax free more than 20 years ago but uh, apparently they want to come back to align with international standards especially in case of avoidance of hybrid mismatches and uh, except and this applies for the market val market values of dividends in kind so instead of this distributing dividends in uh, in the in the property, it will need to be reevaluated. So the so this is in one of the disguised mechanisms to avoid disguised distribution. Uh, the, we're going to change the taxation on investments, which the the closed funds are allowed to postpone the income tax indeterminately. So the closed funds will pay taxes on annual annual basis, and this is going to prevent dividends from double taxation, to align with the new rules. Uh, next slide, please. 
uh, now this one of the the benefits of this reform now is that the individuals and legal entities will have the opportunity to, to reevaluate their immovable property into a far market value, paying a uh, paying uh, a capital gains rate of four percent instead of fifteen percent for the for the natural person and twenty two point five percent for the legal entities. So as you can see, this is going to be a uh, a benefit that this regime is going to to give to people, and it's going to take place for one year only. So after this, we'll get back to the normal rates of uh, capital gains. Uh, currently, the um, the immovable property holdings of a family are taxed at the presumed profits. They have the option to tax to be taxed at the presumed profits, which establish that they have a presumed deduction as well. Once once these companies do not have have really lower costs because they're just renting uh, apartments and uh, um, this type of investments, they don't have that much cost, so they are benefited in comparison to who owns the, the, the movable property as a natural person. This type of regime is supposed to be extinguished, and uh, and legal entities or holdings will have to be taxed at the real income. So this will create more bureaucracy, and people would avoid the constitution of family holdings as a beneficial treatment. But still, the in terms of uh, transfer of shares in case of death and, and the or in case of death and the and the patrimony to be transferred, this is still a beneficial. Uh, as to indirect share transfers in Brazil, there is currently a preparation regimes for indirect share transfer as to capital gains, and this is going to be extinguished with the new rules. Uh, next slide, please. As to the indirect tax reform, Brazil is, Brazil is going to indirect tax reform of all integrating all the all the indirect taxes, which is more than the ones displayed here. But this one is not the having not so much traction on the Congress, and and apparently this is the one they're going to be a, a, this is going to be approved by next year's, and the other ones are maybe going to be approved in the future. Currently, peas and coffins is a social contribution that is levied on the gross revenue and there are currently five different fees and fees in brazil one for importation uh, and one for uh, for profit and different different kind for different type of sectors of industry and this creates a different a lot of complexity especially in the calculation and the legal certainty is hindered by this regime and we, it's expected to be extinguished and unified into a CBS, which would be the contribution on revenue arising for goods and services. And this was going to be a flat rate of 12%, while the current fees and coffins needs to be a gross up calculation, which indeed the, let's say the 12% is higher than the actually, your actual, is higher than the, the actual rate one due to the gross up calculation. Uh, next slide, please. Now we're gonna we're going to deal with the Brazil the transfer price and development and the alignments of the OCD rules. Currently, Brazil has the um, safe harbor regimes in which the, they have presumed profits and the uh, presumed basis and presumed margins and uh, we are brazil is currently trying to align the these rules to the transfer pricing standards here we can have a timeline of the progress of this alignment in 2016 october brazil adopted the cbcr reports in february 2018 they started a joint report with the OCDE to analyze the similarities and divergences between the OCDE and the transfer pricing approach. In July 2019, a joint statement was issued to present the outcomes of the first 15 months of the program. And then 30 July 2020, the Federal Tax Revenue of Brazil launched a survey for consultation as the development of the safe harbor rules and the simplification measures. 
Uh, next slide, please. Reserve transfer pricing approach results in the gaps and divergences in comparison to the OCD approach. Uh, Brazil's approach is simplified and uses uh, so-called formulary proportions, but however, due to the inconsistency, this, this, uh, this can cause double taxation and non-taxation. Due to the mismatch in the taxable base, the limitation of the deduction, and the absence of net methods and profit split methods. Uh, here on the right hand side, you can see one of the four recommendations. There are actually 10, but the four are the most important recommendations from the OCD as to uh, analyzing what needs to be uh, changed in the Brazil transfer pricing regulations. Here, the first point we you know, the recommendation is that uh, Brazil needs to adopt to the other OCD legal instruments of the BAPS action, which are not currently in place, such as the hybrid mismatch uh, regulations. They're not adopted in Brazil currently, but we have other, other mechanisms of anti-abuse rules. Uh, the arm's length principle, which is currently not, uh, not used in practice or, or, in the, or in the hard law. So this needed to be adopted by the Brazil legislation. The transfer pricing methods, which uh, Brazil legislation does not include the uh, freedom of selections, and uh, there's a no absence of transaction net methods and profit split. Uh, the, this also, uh, the also has comparabilities issues due to the uh, absence of delineation of actual transactions, the function assets and risks, and the use of the, uh, the fixed margins that can lead to non arms length outcomes. And the uh, OCDE also made some special considerations, pointing out the weakness of the safe harbor rules, the absence of definitions of intangibles for transfer pricing purposes, the, uh, the same for hard to value intangibles, and the treatment of outbound warranty payments, which are currently subject to limited deductibility. This hinders the attraction of IP to Brazil, and uh, one of the points that are cur currently being criticized to of Brazil transfer pricing regulations is also the absence of the simplified approach for low added, low value added services. As to the as to the point uh, as to the pillar one and two, Brazil is part of the inclusive framework and is expecting to adopt pillar one and two. But there's no so far there is no joint report with OCDE confirming what's going to be the Brazil's role on this and how it's going to how Brazil is going to adopt pillar one or pillar two. There was one, one only statement about pillar two of the minimum tax rate with uh, which mentioned that Brazil wanted to have the minimum tax rates at 30%. However, it was fixed at 15. So these are the only developments so far that did mention Brazil in the inclusive framework. Uh, that's it from my side, guys. Thank you for the participation. And now Hector will deal with the Andean community. Thank you, Victor. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Hector, and I will uh, talk about about uh, the Andean community. Uh, for those who don't know uh, what is the Andean community, first, here is a brief introduction. Uh, the Andean community, also known as CAN, uh, has the objective uh, to promote the development of the members through integration and economic and social cooperation. Uh, this uh, community was created in 1969 and now is formed by Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. But previously, also Venezuela, Venezuela was part of this uh, community only until 2006. Out of these uh, four members, uh, only Colombia is, is member of the OECD. Uh, Peru is uh, on its way to fulfill the requirements, but for now only Colombia is member of the OECD. And together the four uh, countries uh, represent the 11th economy of the world. And in total, uh, there are 100, uh, 11 million inhabitants. Uh, what are the areas that are uh, covered by this uh, community? 
by the Andean community. Uh, for example, uh, free trade agreements, uh, migration, uh, intellectual property, Uh, intellectual property, transportation, and taxation. Uh, regarding taxation, um, there is a double taxation convention be between the, these uh, four uh, countries. This initially was signed in 1971, but then was uh, updated in 2004. The, um, this uh, convention is based on uh, source taxation. Um, yeah, between residence taxation and road source tax taxation, this uh, convention is based on source taxation. And for the, the purpose of this presentation, um, the Article 9 of the OECD model about the associated enterprises uh, is covered in Article 7 of this uh, of the double taxation convention of the Indian community. Here in the next slide, uh, we can see the articles that, I, that are covered uh, regarding the taxation of the income. This is only related to taxation of income because also this uh, convention covers taxation of on capital. So as we can see, um, Article 4, for example, is the same as uh, the OECD model, uh, income from immobile, immobile property. Uh, Article 5 is related to the income from the right to exploit natural resources. Article 6 about the business profits and Article 7 about the associated or related companies. Uh, Article 8 about the transport companies and 9, 10 and 11 are related to the passive income, royalties, interest and dividends and participations. Uh, Article 12 about the capital gains. Article 13 is about the income from the provision of personal services. Article 14 is uh, about the business profit for the provision of services, technical services, technical assistance, and consulting. And uh, finally, Article Article 15 and 16 is about pensions and the income from public entertainment activities. So as I mentioned, this is only related to taxation of income, the chapters. Uh, so now we can see here in this slide uh, an overview of the status of the Action 13 or the documentations related to uh, transfer pricing in these four countries. Uh, first, uh, Bolivia, as you can see, um, there is only the requirement of a, lo a local TP report. Uh, it uh, can be considered similar to the OECD requirements, but it still is um, with uh, local requirements. And there is also a TP form, uh, 601. And there is no master file and CBCR in, in Bolivia yet. Um, I think one of the big difference in this, uh, in the Bolivia uh, structure is that um, the uh, interquartile range is not a uh, use. Um, the range is calculated uh, based on the arithmetical uh, criteria. I think this is one uh, important difference. And second is um, Colombia. Colombia has uh, affected uh, these uh, rules, TP rules, from financial year 2017. As you can see, uh, Colombia has the uh, local file, master file, CBCR, and also uh, another TP form, uh, 120. In this uh, TP form, uh, taxpayers uh, disclose information about uh, related parties, um, whether, whether they are a foreign or local related party. And also an important point is that Colombia is a member of the inclusive framework. Uh, the, uh, as you may know, inclusive framework is uh, these countries and jurisdictions that uh, collaborate on the implementation of measures to tackle to tackle um, tax avoidance. Then uh, Ecuador, as you can see, is uh, similar to to Bolivia. 
there is a local TP report based on uh, local requirements. <clears throat> and also there is a TP form, um, the TP annex, that's based on uh, some thresholds in, on the um, intercompany tra transactions. And in, in first place is uh, Peru. Also here as Colombia, the, these rules, these new rules uh, are effective uh, from the financial year 2017. Uh, previously in Peru, there was a transfer pricing study, but then as, as of 2017, uh, it adopted this, um, the BEPS action 13. Uh, one of the, and also as you can see here, is uh, the local file master file and CBCR are required in Peru, and also there is another TP forms, and also Peru is a member of the inclusive framework. Uh, one important point here in Peru is that uh, there are additional rules, uh, such, such as the benefit tests, uh, the thing cap capitalization rules based on um, BEPS Action 4, and also since 20, uh, 2013, sorry, uh, unilateral and multilateral APAs, APA uh, have been available for all the transactions. So as we can see here, uh, Colombia and Peru um, require more detail uh, regarding the TP documentation. And now we will see in detail uh, all of these uh, four countries. First, uh, Bolivia. Mm, in 2014, um, the tax administration published uh, guidelines to establish the subjects obliged to file the TP report and informative TP form. But it was in 2017 when the um, Bolivian tax administration makes uh, for the first time reference to the OECD when it publishes uh, the list of non-cooperative territories. Um, this in this 2017, um, I think it was one of the um, reasons of uh, to publish the non-cooperative uh, territories. In 2017, it happens the Panama Papers scandal, and there were some uh, Bolivian companies uh, involved. Then in 2021, um, yeah, there were some um, extension in the deadlines uh, because of COVID. Uh, depending on the the end of the fiscal year of the companies, but uh, here in Bolivia uh, we cannot see like any TP case develop so far. Uh, TP audits were initiated in fiscal year uh, 2017 for a few companies in Bolivia, but still there are no results available uh, from these audits yet. Also. Um, there are no additional changes regarding the implementation of BEPS Action 13 in the national legislation. But then, um, what can we expect uh, from Bolivia? Maybe, uh, as I mentioned before, um, is um, in Colombia and Peru, uh, they also started with a local TP report, and then uh, both countries adopted the three-tier documentation. So I think that Bolivia could follow uh, Action 13, uh, could follow the same path as uh, Colombia and Peru, but also it depends on uh, political decisions. The next country is Colombia. Um, the recent developments in, in Colombia is that uh, in June of this year, uh, Colombia joined the International Compliance Assurance Program, ICAP, for multinational entities with effect from uh, September 2021. Uh, as you may know, uh, the ICAP is the cooperative multilateral engagement between m &E's groups um, that are willing to engage actively and transparently with tax administrations in different jurisdictions. Uh, the, the reason of this ICAP is to have like fewer disputes uh, requiring resolution through mutual agreements uh, proceedings. 
So this is one of the recent developments in, in Colombia. But also in, in July, in August of this year, uh, the Colombian Tax Administration uh, promulgated some uh, resolutions regarding, regarding the technical filing requirements for the CBCR, the master file, and the local file. But uh, this was uh, more related to technical um, filing requirements. And one um, uh, important thing here is, and especially in these uh, COVID times, when there are like extraordinary costs, in income tax law, Article 260, uh, it mentions that significant difference in comparability must take into account aspects such as a characteristic of the, the operations, functions, assets, and risk, contractual terms, economic or market circumstances, and business strategies. And this difference can be eliminated by making, making sufficiently reliable adjustments for comparison. And in 2018, there is a case law between uh, Vidrio Andino and the Colombian Tax Authority. Vidrio Andino is a company that uh, manufactures uh, glass. And in 20, 20, 2006, sorry, decided to advance some costs and of a plant. Uh, it, uh, it, be, it began a construction of a glass plant. And therefore, because uh, it incurring some cost, uh, that year there were some uh, there was le less less profit for Vidrio Andino. And the Colombian Tax Authority mentioned that the, the these costs were not exceptional because uh, Vidrio Andino decided to advance these costs, so uh, they were not uh, unpredictable. So the, the Colombian Tax Authority says that the, these overhead costs are normal and not exceptional by nature. Uh, they were not unpredictable because the company had the leeway and chose to incur in those expenses. So for, uh, for the, from the perspective of the Colombian Tax Authority, uh, these costs were not uh, unpredictable. But then um, the court decided that this overhead cost um didn't result in, in an increase of the revenues and also that unpredictable is not a condition to accept this uh this cost it means that um this cost like effectively uh, affect the, the profit of the birandino and if not, it's not one of the conditions to be unpredictable because uh if it affects the the profit and the pnl of the birandino it also can be considered in one of the adjustment uh, process. Then the third country is uh, Ecuador. Uh, Ecuador has TP rules since 2005, and in its national law, especially expressly recognized the OECD guidelines as a technical reference. There are other signs that show that Ecuador is trying to adhere to the OECD guidelines. For example, in 2018, the local government established um, a commission, the creation of a commission in charge to coordinate and establish the steps to follow for the addition uh, process of Ecuador as a member of the OECD. Then the same year, in 2018, um, the Ecuadorian Tax Administration signed a multilateral convention on mutual administrative assistance in tax matters. Uh, the MCAA is the first international agreement for the adoption of the automatic exchange of financial information. Then in 2019, um, Ecuador committed to implement the automatic exchange of financial account information. So these three um, things can be considered that Ecuador is trying to adhere to these OECD guidelines. Also, yeah, uh, regarding the, the recent TP developments in, 20, in 2020, then the Ecuadorian Tax Administration uh, published some rules regarding the export, export of bananas. Uh, before, 
this this case uh, it's important to know that uh, ecuador main exports include petroleum products fish and uh, including shrimp and bananas bananas represent uh, around uh, 15 percent of the total exports in 2019 so why um, there was a, a rule regarding the, the export of bananas uh, first there is, there is like a, a strong competition uh, between uh, South American countries and also the Caribbean Pacific region. And also um, there were some cases when the, the bananas were exported to a uh, low tax uh, jurisdiction. And then from this low tax jurisdiction, uh, were export, the bananas were exported to the final uh, customers. So this, uh, Triangle was one one of the reasons that also there are rules regarding the, the export of bananas, but these rules are um, basically saying that um, the bananas are kind of considered as a commodity because now it will be based on the um, on the public price that uh, is published in the in the Ecuadorian Tax Administration website. For example, if the it depends on the country uh, destination country. For example, if the the bananas are export to EU, it will be based on the Eurostat. Uh, if they're export to the US, based in the US uh, uh, in the price that is published by the US Department of Agriculture, and so on. Uh, the main uh, countries were um, yeah the European Union, <laughs> the, all the countries in the, in the European Union, the US and the, and Russia. Also regarding this, this thing of um, the transactions that go first from Ecuador to a tax haven and then to the final customer, um, there was a case in 2012 that involved uh, Ecuador selling bananas to a company in the Bahamas. And then this this company of the Bahamas export these uh, bananas to Japan. So basically, in this case, the Japanese tax authority um, said that the price that the Japanese company paid to the the company in the Bahamas um, was above the interquartile range. So it was not set at arm's length price. Finally, Peru. Uh, recently, um, in December 2020, the Peruvian Tax Administration announced that uh, Peru met the required OECD information security and confidentiality and standards for automatic exchange purposes. As a consequence, the deadline of for submitting the CVCR for fiscal years 2017, 18, and 19 uh, was on January 2021. And more recently, this uh, this month, the government request in tax matters uh, includes uh, two proposals related to TP. But first, why the government is trying to implement new uh, tax measures? Well, the, the purpose is uh, to increase the tax GDP ratio. Now in Peru, it's around uh, 13%. Uh, to have an example, the OECD level is 33%. So the government now uh, has different measures that uh, are not uh, yet approved, but uh, is negotiating with the, the parliament. Uh, one of those is uh, to increase taxes on income from lease of property, interest, uh, royalties. So basically to increase taxes uh, of, for the passive income, then create a simple regime for small medium companies, and then also um, trying to follow follow the the trend on the digital services. Uh, they are planning to impose VAT on digital services that are consumed in in Peru. But regarding TP, there are two um, changes that I mentioned. Not in detail, but uh, here we can have an overview of what we can expect. Um, first, uh, they're 
putting more, they're trying to put more emphasis on to use the discount cash flows to calculate the market value in transfer of shares, even between unrelated third parties. And the second point here is the review. Uh, they're trying to, they want to review and modify TP rules, especially modifications to the so-called um, six methods. Um, as you may know, the six methods is related to the commodities. Um, especially because Peru has an important uh, mining industry. They are trying to solve uh, some imperfections in this uh, fixed method. That in some cases, uh, it happened that the Peruvian tax administration required some information to the taxpayers, but uh, they didn't have this um, information available at that moment. So they are trying to fix and to solve these imperfections. Um, why is important this sixth method in Peru? As I mentioned, the mining industry is very important. Um, also, uh, maybe we can see here in Peru that uh, the mining industry is more likely to undergo uh, audits, given that 60% of Peru exports are minerals and approximately 30% are sold to related parties. That's all for the Andean community. It's an overview of the recent TP developments and some cases uh, regarding the uh, transfer pricing. Then Belisa will continue with the TP developments in Argentina. Hi, uh, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, yes, uh, I'm. my name is Belisa Severini and we are going to talk about the TP development in Argentina. Um, in Argentina, uh, we have a TP regulation since more than 20 years, uh, but in the last year, we have been seeing quite a, do a lot of changes in the regulations in order to align the, the local regulation with the BEPS action plan. Um, if uh, can, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, well, in particular, in relation to BEPS Action 13, uh, we have that uh, the, the current obligations for the co local company are uh, the following. Uh, first of all, we have the country by country report that uh, must be applied for a multinational group with consolidated annual revenue uh, greater than 750 million euros in the prior uh, year uh, of the submission. This is like uh, in other countries, the, the same threshold. But something special in, uh, in Argentina is uh, that there is uh, another obligation for all the entities uh, resident in Argentina that are member of multinational group, uh, even though the multinational group is not applied to, to, to submit the CBC report in, in other jurisdiction. But uh, all the companies that are member of multinational group has the obligation to submit two notifications to the local tax authority, uh, reporting uh, some general information about the group. Uh, for example, uh, uh, in one notification, uh, the local company has to complete a, 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 a form uh, uh, telling which is the ultimate parent entity uh, if the multinational group is subject to, to the CBC report because uh, of the, um, their total consolidated revenues. Uh, and after that, uh, the, there is an obligation uh, to another notification in which the local company uh, should, should in, uh, inform in which jurisdiction the CBC report was submitted and in, wh in what day. Um, and well, th there is another information uh, more uh, general. Uh, in addition to the country by country report, uh, in Argentina we have the obligation to, to submit to the tax authority the master file, 
and uh, the master file should be in Spanish. So uh, if the, the, the group has a, a master file in another language, then for, for Argentina purposes, uh, uh, this master file should be translated into Spanish. Uh, in this case, the threshold for the submission of the master file uh, was recently modified and now um, uh, the threshold are um, uh, two circumstances have to be verified. One of these is uh, um, related to the total consolidated annual revenue of the group that um, for in order to, to be subject to the submission of the master file, uh, this amount should exceed uh, 4,000 million Argentine pesos. Um, before it was a uh, um, 2000 million so this was uh, upgraded uh, in the um, recently this is a uh, approx uh, 38 million us dollar or uh, 33 million euro uh, in the previous year uh, of the submission in addition to this condition the the local company uh, should have a transaction with related companies from abroad uh, for amount uh, that exceed as a whole in the fiscal uh, period uh, of um, the amount of 3 million Argentine pesos, which is approx uh, 28,500 US dollar, or perform transaction individually of 300,000 Argentine pesos. Uh, which is uh, approx 2,800 US dollar. Um, in the next uh, slide, please. Uh, uh, recently, the, uh, the, the, um, there was a, another modification, and now the, there is a, a possibility for the local company to ratify the master file that was previously submitted. So if the, in the current period there is no changes in the master file, then the local company can um, submit a note ratifying the previous master file submitted. But if there is any change in the, in the group, in the master file, then uh, uh, the local company will have to submit again the master file uh, in Spanish, as, as we said before. Then, uh, well, another obligation for the local company is uh, the submission of the local file and the TP form uh, 2668. Um, in this case, the obligations are for companies that perform transactions that, that exceed exceed as a whole in the fiscal year uh, the 3 million uh, Argentine pesos, which is uh, 88,000 US dollar approximately, or a transaction that are individually of 300,000 Argentine pesos. And these transactions uh, are referring to transactions performed by the local entity with related parties from ab abroad or uh, third party entities that, uh, that are located in non cooperative jurisdiction. And for this, uh, we have a list of jurisdiction in, in, a re in the regulatory decree of the income tax law, uh, specifying which countries are considered non cooperative. Uh, in the Latin region, for example, we have uh, countries like Paraguay, Bolivia, Nicaragua, and Honduras. And so all the transactions that I, I are performed with entities, even though they are third parties, but if they are located in, in this jurisdiction, then this transaction must be analyzed uh, according to the transfer pricing regulation. And the same with uh, jurisdiction that are considered uh, low or no taxation, the, the tax havens uh, uh, as we generally um, call. Uh, and in this case, for the Argentine perspective, 
This means uh, um, countries that have a corporate income tax rate below 15%. Uh, in the region, for example, uh, we have Paraguay that falls under this criteria. So uh, in order to uh, um, count uh, for this amount for, uh, for the transaction, we have to see the, all the, the transactions performed with related parties as well as for third parties located in non-cooperative jurisdiction or in the heavens. In addition to this, we have also some obligation for a transaction of import and export of tangible goods performed with third party. In this case, we have um, if uh, the transactions are uh, uh, performed with third party for an amount uh, 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 that exceeds 10 million Argentine pesos, which is approximately 95,000 US dollar, then the, the company has to, to fill the TP form 2668. So it, it is the same TP form as for the um, relative party transaction, but uh, to complete with information about the import and export uh, with third party. And something new in Argentina is uh, uh, the, the, the possibility to, uh, for some companies to opt for a new simplified regime. In this case, uh, in, in the cases where uh, the company, the taxpayer, uh, only perform import or export uh, with third party uh, with a, for a, an amount that is less than 60 million uh, Argentine pesos, which is approximately 570,000 US dollar, then the taxpayer can opt for this new simplified regime, which, uh, it, which is, is uh, this uh, a new TP form, uh, 2672, with some information, but not uh, um, so complex as the uh, other TP form. But um, we are going to see now uh, which uh, conditions must uh, the company um, fulfill in order to opt for this regime. In the cases of the third party, um, as, as we say, the taxpayer must only perform this uh, transaction with third party. If, for example, uh, the company perform also transaction with related party, then they cannot opt for this uh, simplified regime. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Well, here we are going to analyze which are these uh, conditions and requirements uh, for the companies to, to be able to opt for this new simplified regime. Um, as we said before, it, it's not for all the company. Uh, it is for certain companies that, uh, well, in principle, uh, have the obligation to submit the local file and the TP form. Um, that is the, the, for companies that, uh, according to their intercompany transactions, uh, are above the, the threshold. And um, that can be able to choose for this new simplified regime, uh, replacing uh, such obligation of, of submit the TP uh, study and the TP form by completing this new TP form 2672. Uh, uh, but for this, uh, the company uh, must um, uh, meet certain condition which is listed in the, uh, a new general resolution, which was issued by the local tax authority in June this year. And uh, among said condition, uh, the, the, there are, um, the, the companies should be a small or medium-sized company, uh, according to their total annual billings. Uh, and these uh, currently 
means that the total billing should be about uh, 2,600 million Argentine pesos, which is more or less a uh, 25 million US dollar. In addition to uh, meet certain other requirements. So this, uh, the company should be under this condition, but additional, they, they must uh, meet certain other requirements. Uh, the second condition uh, is uh, that the total international transaction with related party should not exceed 2.50% of the total billing. So the total uh, um, transaction with related party should not be uh, more than 2.50% of the total billing in addition to uh, meet certain requirements. Uh, these uh, additional requirements are uh, the following. Uh, companies have uh, not present recurrent negative results. The company have not uh, undergone a business restructuring in the last three years. The companies um, should not have significant operation with related parties or uh, locate, uh, entities located in non-cooperative jurisdiction or in tax heaven, that uh, that operation uh, involve uh, royalties, license rights, or a research and development agreement. Or um, the companies should not uh, have operation of uh, services, either acquisition or provision of services. Uh, in addition, another condition is that uh, um, there should not be uh, loans with related parties. And another condition is uh, in case uh, that, that there are import or export operation, there, sh there should not be uh, the, the intervention of an international intermediary. So all these requirements should be met in addition to the condition one and two. So. The, the, as, as I before, this is not for all the companies. The, the company should uh, uh, meet all these requirements. In the next slide, please. Something that um, also is uh, important to know is that some companies uh, are excluded from this simplified regime. So we have if the companies are part of a multinational group that uh, must uh, submit the country by country report, um, no matter in which jurisdiction they have to comply with this obligation, uh, that companies cannot uh, opt for the simplified regime. Uh, as we said before, this means that uh, all all local company which belong to multinational group with a consolidated annual revenues greater than 750 million euros cannot opt for this uh, simplified regime because that a uh, multinational group has the obligation to submit the country by country report. Uh, or uh, companies that must submit the master file uh, here in Argentina. Uh, as we, uh, we saw before, this means that if the multinational group has a, a consolidated annual rebellion greater than 4,000 million Argentine pesos, uh, then the local company will have the, the obligation to submit, to, to submit the master file and consequently cannot be um, able to opt for this simplified regime. And will have the, uh, the obligation of submission of the uh, TP local file and the TP uh, form 2668. Um, in addition, uh, it is important to note that uh, even though the companies can opt for the simplified regime, they have to complete this new TP form uh, with detail of the transactions performed. And in addition, a company have to declare that the transactions are at arm's length. So in fact, company 
will have to prepare the, the transfer pricing analysis of their intercompany transaction, uh, even though they 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 didn't they they don't have to submit the the TP uh, local file to the tax authority. They have to prepare and conserve uh, as uh, documentation just in case it, it is um, uh, required by the local tax authority. And apart from this, the local tax authority also can require the local file to these companies that uh, uh, opt for the simplified regime. And in this case, this company will have 45 days to submit the local file. In the next slide, Uh, some um, other uh, transfer pricing developments are uh, related with the COVID pandemic. And for um, this reason, in May 2021, uh, the AFIP, which is the, the local tax authority, um, provides some, some guidelines with recommendations and suggestions in order um, for the, the companies, the local companies, to consider in their transfer pricing analysis for the years that were affected by the pandemic. Uh, these guidelines uh, are in addition to uh, uh, an, an extension of the deadline for the submission of the, the TP local file and the TP form for three additional months for the fiscal years ended between December 2020 and December 2021. So if the um, fiscal um, year ends on um, December 2021, the deadline for transfer pricing will be in September 2022, exceptionally, because otherwise the deadline uh, should be in June if the closing date is in December. Uh, but considering the, the, the particular period uh, due to the pandemic, I think uh, um, grant a, 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 a three months additional um, period for the deadline for the submission of the transfer pricing documentation. And this is uh, uh, because uh, it, it is known that uh, this particular uh, period it, it's more complex and uh, especially um, it is difficult to prepare the comparability analysis. In this sense, uh, AFIP uh, establishes uh, a series of recommendations and suggestions that uh, it hopes that the, the taxpayer will include in the transfer pricing analysis. These guidelines uh, basically refer to the description of function, assets, and risk of the local company, as well as the uh, multinational group. Uh, in addition, they um, refer to the uh, possible adjustment that uh, would be necessary to make uh, to the financial information of the local company due to uh, the, the situation of the, the pandemic and the effect of, of, of the pandemic in the local figures. And uh, finally, uh, there is some recommendation about uh, how to perform the analysis of the comparables. In the next slide, we have a um, uh, which are the suggestions uh, about the documentation that the local company must prepare in the uh, local uh, transfer pricing documentation. Uh, first of all, um, the, um, AFIP uh, state that the document uh, company has to document how and to what extent the, the pandemic affects the the financial uh, information of the company. It is not enough to say, uh, for example, that, uh, for example, the, um, the, the sales drop. You have to document, uh, document all the uh, specific uh, um, reason uh, and how 
it, it was affected the, the financial information of the company. In addition, um, it is important to document, document the economic effect of the pandemic and how uh, um, the, there was uh, some changes in some risks that, that may be assumed by the local entity due to the pandemic, and uh, which is the, the, the differences uh, re in relation to the normal operation. Uh, in the same way, uh, if, there, if there are extraordinary results of the local entity, uh, should be a um, um, document uh, in, with an in-deep analysis uh, showing uh, how the, the, the economic situation of the pandemic affect the result of the local entity. And uh, for, for these purposes, uh, AFIP established some kind of, of information that the local company have to document, for example, a, a variation in the sale volumes uh, compared to sales generated in previous years, or uh, changes in the use of the installed capacity, or uh, to document which are the exceptional or incremental costs borne due to the pandemic or the comparison of internal budgeted or forecast data related to sale cost and profitability uh, in relation to the uh, actual result. All these will, uh, will provide uh, the local company with sufficient information to justify any adjustment that uh, um, must be performed to to the figures of the local entity. In addition to this, um, it, it would be important to uh, provide um, information about the specific industry or, and business and how uh, the, the effect of the pandemic affect all the, the, the industry. In the next slide, please. Another issue is to, to document the, uh, if the local company receive a, a government assistance, and if so, uh, the, the quantity of this assistance and how it was, um, uh, how it, it, it was um, uh, uh, the treatment uh, from an accounting purposes. And this is important because then we will see that uh, the same uh, should be checked in the comparable companies in the benchmarking analysis. Um, then something uh, that also um, it is in these guidelines uh, is uh, to uh, carefully um, uh, analyze and make the proper justification uh, if there are changes in the risk assumed by the local company before and after the pandemic. Um, in, in this case, for example, AFIP make reference to the situation of a low risk distributor that uh, if in the past uh, this low risk distributor um, 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 fixed return, then after the pandemic, it, it is not logic that this uh, low risk distributor um, is um, performing losses, that the multinational group uh, allocate losses of the pandemic to this low distributor. So any, any change in the structure or in the distribution of risk and responsibility or any modification in the agreement between the local company and the related party from abroad must be um, carefully justified and um, uh, the, the logic behind this should be um, documented. In the next slide, um, there, there are also some uh, recommendations by a tip 
regarding the benchmarking analysis. In this sense, uh, it, uh, AFIP states that uh, the financial information of the comparable should be the, uh, for the same fiscal year uh, as the testing party. For example, if we are um, uh, analyzing the fiscal year 2020, we, use, we must use the same fiscal year 2020 for both the testing party and the comparables. And in this sense, uh, AFIP states that the multiple year analysis will not be acceptable. Um, in addition, also, uh, AFIP states that uh, it is preferable to use local or regional comparables uh, to, to have the same market uh, um, as the testing party. Then, Another issue is uh, concerning the, the operating losses that uh, it says that uh, comparables will not be accepted uh, with operating losses uh, unless uh, it is prop um, properly uh, just justified and demonstrate that such losses are is something that is characteristic of the business or due to circumstance of the market or the, or the industry, and the condition that leads to the, to the loss is not a consequence or factor that's a, a, that affects comparability. So, uh, in general, a company with operating losses will not be accept, accepted. But uh, in some cases uh, where you can prove that there is something um, um, for in general for the industry or for that particular business, then uh, you can accept one uh, one or two companies with losses, but you cannot prepare an interquartile range, for example, with all company having uh, losses uh, in the result. Um, then, uh, as we said before, uh, uh, one have to check if the comparable company receive a government assistance for uh, and in if so in which uh, terms and condition if they are similar to the government assistance received by the local entity uh, then um, in general uh, one have to investigate about the circumstances uh, of, of the comparable and see the differences and similarities uh, between the circumstances of the testing party. And by doing this exercise, one can, can make any adjustment to the testing party or, or to the comparables in order to be um, consistent and uh, make the, the, uh, the economic analysis. Um, in the same way, one, uh, one has to investigate about the the, the risks that are borne by the comparable and see if they are the same risk as the local company. Um, as as you, you see, this is our something that uh, it, it, it is supposed that all the benchmarking analysis should perform like this, but uh, for this particular period of the pandemic, AFIP uh, prepared this guideline and um, and it, it, that is the reason why it, it is expected that all, all the company uh, follow this, uh, this guideline to prepare their, their um, economic analysis. Uh, in the next slide, well, finally, um, uh, the, 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 there is uh, another um, recommendation for um, uh, situations where the, the COVID has an impact on the transfer pricing policies or in the value chain of the multinational group. In these cases, this impact should be justified uh, in the master file. Uh, so um, basically, um, uh, as we have been seeing, there are four parts to consider uh, according to these uh, guidelines. Uh, first one is uh, the, the necessity, the necessity uh, of uh, perform a robot function analysis for the local entity. Uh, the second to prepare 
uh, very well the local figures of the local entity uh, and verify uh, how the, the effect of the pandemic affect the, the financial information of the local company in order to um, be able to perform any adjustment. Uh, third, uh, the, the, um, the need to perform a solid benchmarking analysis with a detailed analysis of the selected comparable. And in this way, it is important not only if you are preparing the benchmarking analysis with a database, uh, not only uh, check th that information, but also uh, check their annual report of, of each of the selected comparables. And um, finally, a description of the pandemic effect in the um, TP policy and in the value chain of the multinational group in the master file. So, well, up to here, I, we have the, the recently TP development. And uh, sorry, I, 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 know I am seeing the, the clock and I, I'm sorry that uh, we pass off the, the hour stipulated uh, for this uh, webinar. Uh, I don't know if there is any uh, questions. We we are the three of us uh, uh, happy to to hear from from you. If you have any particular question, uh, if it is not possible to for you to to have the the questions now, you always can write an email or call us. Uh, any of us, and I uh, will be more than happy to answer your questions. Yeah, currently there doesn't seem to be any more, doesn't seem to be any questions. Uh, since we've uh, pushed over time, I think we shall end the webinar here. As uh, Belisa did say, of course, if you guys have any questions, um, please feel free to email any of us um, at TP. Okay. Uh, thank you again, Belisa, Hector, and uh, Victor for today's webinar, and I wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.